remind everybody that this is being recorded. Um, just so you know that that's happening in the background. And uh, if everybody except our uh, presenter, once uh, Rachel Starrett can mute your, your mics, that would be great. So we can eliminate any of that background uh, noise. Um, I guess that is it for housekeeping, other than I'm, I'm so thrilled to have Rachel here and even more thrilled that Rachel volunteered to present her work, which uh, shows a considerable amount of enthusiasm for her, her research area. And, and this is super important research. Uh, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Dr. Shoveler now to do the intro. Thank you, Jill, and I'm also delighted to be here um, in my capacity as VP Research and Innovation at the IWK. Um, this is a very important uh, topic, um, and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Rachel Olivier, who is a registered nurse on the adult surgery unit and in the COVID-19 uh, PAC, the Primary Assessment Centre at the IWK. As well, Rachel is also a PhD candidate. And as I just mentioned, for those of you who were on the line a bit earlier, the recipient of a Vanier scholarship at Dalhousie University School of Nursing. And we all know and recognize what a prestigious and important award the Vanier is, one of Canada's premier, premier scholarships. So many congratulations to you, Rachel, on that. Mm -hmm. Rachel's research interests um, span a wide range of important topics, including global health and women's health and maternal health. And uh, of course, the experience that Rachel brings from her clinical work and her nursing experience in international settings, ranging from Zambia to Tanzania and beyond. Um, really, I think, offer a very important bridging and a critical lens um, to bring together the clinical teaching and research uh, parts of, of uh, the work that she, she is leading. And a special note, I want to uh, point out that uh, very recently, um, Rachel was named as one of Optimize Magazine's top 100 healthcare leaders for 2021. So congratulations, um, Rachel, we're thrilled to know that. And thank you for being with us today to really help us understand what's happening um, in terms of the postpartum period and sexual health here in Nova Scotia. So I will turn the microphone over to you and uh, thank you so much for being here and making time in your busy agenda to uh, share your presentation today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shoveler. And um, yes, as I've said, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so exciting to be, you know, um, presenting this work, um, you know, now that I've so, you know done my data collection and have, you know, exciting findings to share. Uh, so I hope for, of course, a rich, you know, uh, discussion today and, you know, questions afterwards as well in terms of, you know, how can we keep this momentum going and, um, and uh, you know, implement uh, these very important findings into care, you know, at the IWK as well as, you know, across Canada and perhaps globally as well. Um, so without further ado, I'll get, uh, get into it. Uh, of course, first, um, I would like to acknowledge that where I present, um, pre I'm presenting today from Tibuktuk, uh, also known as Halifax. And so we'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Wolashtawik people first signed with the British crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Wolashtawik title and establish the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We are all treaty people. Uh, so as uh, Dr. Shoveler presented, uh, I, you know, come from sort of a variety of, of lenses, I guess, uh, nursing being, of course, you know, my clinical focus um, and something that very much informs my research. Um, I'm supervised as well by Dr. Megan Aston and Dr. Sherry Price at the Dalhousie University School of Nursing. Uh, so very exciting to be working, you know, with a team there and to have the support from, you know, my committee as well as my supervisors in conducting this work. Um, I also uh, would like to declare I have no conflicts of interest, um, but of course would like to thank um, those um, entities or organizations who financially supported this doctoral work, uh, which include Dalhousie University, 
uh, the Killam Trust Canadian Nurses Foundation Research Nova Scotia Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the Vanier Canada Graduate Scholarship Program. Uh, so to outline well, what I'll speak to you about today, I'll begin with some background on existing research and literature uh, surrounding postpartum sexual health. Um, and then I'll, I'll explain sort of the aims and purpose of, of my study, uh, how I went about it um, through the methods, and then uh, results and, of course, significance for, for clinical practice and research. Uh, and, of course, would like to leave some time at the end for questions and uh, comments from the audience for sure are welcome. Uh, so beginning with background. Uh, so looking at sexual health, um, I always like to begin by sort of situating this research and uh, grounding it in sort of, again, what's talked about today, uh, what do we know, and, you know, what's also not known in, in the scholarly literature. Um, so sexual health, um, using the World Health Organization's definition, uh, is where I always like to begin whenever I talk about this, this topic. Um, so it's a state of physical, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality and requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships. I know this is not the entire definition, um, and there have been, you know, definitions have certainly shifted throughout time and history depending on, you know, social influences, uh, political influences, um, but this definition is still currently in use by the World Health Organization and was first um, released in 2006 uh, formally. Um, but what I always like to emphasize here is sort of the beginning of this definition um, being that sexual health is physical, mental, and social. Um, it's difficult to pinpoint, you know, a perfect definition that I think captures the individuality, but also complexity of sexuality and sexual health. Um, but I believe this is, you know, an important starting point to kind of see how it's framed uh, today uh, from an international um, health body such as the WHO. And when we look at academic literature and, you know, research that's been conducted on sexual health after birth or sexual health postpartum, um, a lot of it is largely explored um, and been understood in physically focused ways. And so what I mean by that is a lot of us, you know, I think a lot of research has sort of positioned sexual health as, oh, okay, that's, that's sexual activity, that's um, sexual intercourse. Um, so we think about pelvic pain, we think about uh, dyspareunia, which is um, sexual or uh, pain during sexual intercourse. Um, and sexual functioning. So a lot of these kind of words such as functioning have come out of, of that. And um, as I've said, physically focused, um, you know, aspects of sexual health, which are of course very important. Um, but I, I think it's led it to become a little bit more narrow. Um, and so it's sort of, you know, looking at that and what was there um, as I was, you know, looking at, you know, what, what did I want to, you know, how did I want to approach this topic? I saw that there was, you know, a dearth of literature exploring emotional or relational aspects of sexual health. Um, and that can include so many, you know, aspects, uh, but some can be identity, relationships, intimacy, and desire. And so when I was looking, you know, at the research and what, what was out there, I saw there was a little bit, there were piece, pieces of it in, in some qualitative research, um, but we really, there isn't, you know, a very well-rounded understanding of, you know, how postpartum individuals experience um, identity relationships and how that ties with sexual health. Um, so that was something I really thought would be interesting to explore and to perhaps open up as I approached and planned, you know, how I wanted to conduct my, uh, my doctoral study. So looking at non-physical aspects, um, so emotional and psychological aspects of sexual health um, and sexuality have historically been constructed as being less important than components, um, physical components of um, postpartum individual sexual health. Uh, and so with that, you know, that's sort of where I saw the gap um, of kind of understanding, you know, um, again, going off of the WHO definition of, you know, um, physical, mental and social, bringing in, you know, those other two aspects, the mental and the social um, aspects of, of sexual health, um, and perhaps opening that, that up a bit more. And so looking at the literature, as I said, there were pieces um, that did explore non-physical influences on women's sexual health um, and or postpartum sexual health. Um, and those included mental health changes, um, you know, the postpartum period is often framed as sort of a bit of a roller coaster. There's a lot of change all at once. Um, and so, of course, it's natural to, you know, to think that, OK, there's there's likely a lot of kind of shift, shift and change going on here. Um, uh, also, in relation to, to sexual health and, and more broadly and, you know, in life in general. Um, so, you know, a lack of support from partners or loved ones was something that was, you know, evidence in the literature as being of importance to sexual health, body image, fatigue or lack of sleep. Uh, relationship issues or uh, relationship satisfaction. 
um, depression and role conflict. So these are just kind of some of the other aspects that, you know, when I say, uh, you know, emotional, physical or social aspects of sexual health, you know, what do I mean by that? Uh, these are some examples that have been evidenced in the literature as being um, of importance to, to postpartum sexual health. Uh, so important to just kind of situate um, um, those aspects. Uh, so looking now at the purpose and methods of my study. So I aim to explore how postpartum individuals experience their sexual health after birth, as well as how those experiences are influenced or negotiated through relations of power. And so I know that at first the purpose is a little bit of a um, kind of a lot of jargon in there, a little bit of a mouthful, but um, essentially, you know, I wanted to open up of, you know, any experiences um, folks wanted to bring forward who were postpartum. Um, so that could be absolutely physical, but it could also be, you know, emotional, relational or social. Um, and, you know, in, in, again, identifying sort of the best lens um, or a useful lens to, uh, to apply to this research, um, I was, you know, uh, learned about feminist post-structuralism in some of my master's studies. Um, uh, one of my supervisors is, you know, considered an expert in, in the use of feminist post-structuralism, also known as FPS. Um, and it really seemed like it fit, you know, as a great lens to sort of um, look at, you know, how sexual health is framed. Um, so feminist post-structuralism, you know, has a way of um, attending to discourse and relations of power. And I'll explain what I mean by, by those two words uh, on the next slide. But it looks a lot also at meaning. So thinking of sexual health, you know, as a very taboo topic uh, in Western society in Nova Scotia, this was a way to kind of uncover, okay, what's really going on, you know, um, uh, uncovering kind of that, you know, some experiences that are often very invisible. And, you know, postpartum sexual health uh, was was one of those topics where it's not talked about. And even if it is talked about, it's talked about in very you know specific ways um, that aren't necessarily meaningful to postpartum individuals. And, you know, that's what I was finding as, as evidence in, in what I was doing, you know, uh, my literature review and preparation for conducting this study. Um, so some other main tenets of FPS include subjectivity, agency, as well as beliefs, values and practices. Um, and so all this kind of comes together to say, okay, you know, how is the, the person experiencing uh, this issue? Um, how do they frame that issue for themselves? How does it influence their beliefs or values? And then how are those beliefs being, you know, shaped or how are they shaping them in response uh, to certain social or institutional discourses? Um, so I used a purposive recruitment strategy um, and did 11 interviews over the telephone. I conducted uh, or did a data collection during uh, the early fall, so September, October of 2020. Uh, so of course, we're uh, continued to be in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, I did offer the um, participants to uh, do the interview either over Zoom, um, they could have their camera off or on whatever they were comfortable with, um, or over telephone and a lot, every single one of them chose telephone. Um, so I think, you know, it's, uh, it was interesting to kind of, of course, you know, have uh, a study and uh, to do the interviews over the phone. Um, but I found it really, I think, was a way that made participants, I think, feel perhaps even more comfortable than they, they might have felt in person. Um, and, you know, also have the flexibility of still, you know, some said, oh, you know, let's do phone because I need to be able to, you know, be breastfeeding or carrying the, the baby and things like that. So, um, yeah, I think it, um, participants found it was a positive experience to, uh, to speak over the phone with me. Um, and so I, in total, I uh, interviewed 11 postpartum individuals who were between one and six months postpartum, um, 18 years of age or older and living in Nova Scotia. Um, so with that, you know, having one to six months, I really wanted to capture, um, you know, I think these experiences, these emotions, these feelings about sexual health after birth, right, as they were happening. Um, and so that was my rationale for, for choosing that kind of, you know, one to six month um, time period. And um, I did not collect um, any demographic data, but rather allowed for um, those sorts, that sort of information to emerge uh, naturally within the interviews. So if participants wanted to share, you know, certain aspects of their identity um, that could be shared in the interview um, as something that they, you know, authentically brought forward as a relevant part of their, you know, experiences of postpartum sexual health. Um, and so that was my approach in, in conducting the, the study. Um, and so kind of, you know, going back to my methodology, again, feminist post-structuralism discourse, what do I mean by that? <laughs> um, so discourse, you know, essentially, um, it represents the status quo, kind of the taken for granted. And just a lot of times, this is kind of the way things are. So, um, you know, I, um, I think my supervisor, uh, Dr. Megan Aston, uses this example, and I'll use it as well of, um, you know, looking at, say, for example, breastfeeding. 
Um, and if someone, you know, comes, if someone's, you know, breastfeeding in public, as they're legally allowed to do, uh, but, you know, say someone else comes up and says, oh, you shouldn't be doing that in public, that's, you know, that's, that's inappropriate. And, you know, you could ask that person, well, why? Why is, you know, breastfeeding inappropriate here? And they'll, they'll just kind of respond, well, just because. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's, it's hard to name. Discourse is difficult to name because it's just kind of the way uh, the way we live, the way, you know, we're meant to act. And, you know, it's hard, it can be difficult to name where that comes from. Um, so that's sort of, again, what my task is in, in uh, you know, uh, applying discourse analysis uh, to the participant quotes and to their experiences to try and pull out, um, okay, what's going on here? Where, you know, where is this coming from? What is the discourse? Uh, so even naming discourse um, is really powerful because that's how we start um, you know, to, again, name issues, um, and that begins the process of being able to deconstruct and then reconstruct. Um, so that's really what I find meaningful about, you know, applying applying this, this uh, feminist post-structuralist lens to this research and discourse analysis as part of that. Um, so again, with discourse, uh, that kind of brings in relations of power. And so that represents how um, people kind of respond to discourse, how they negotiate those relations of power. Um, and so there exist, you know, dominant and non-dominant social and institutional discourses in the world. And uh, all of us uh, choose uh, um, to challenge, resist, accept. Uh, there are so many ways to respond to those discourses. And we all might do so differently, depending on the discourse, depending on um, our beliefs, our identity, how we position ourselves as individual subjects um, can all affect how um, we respond to discourse and can affect how postpartum individuals respond to certain discourses about their sexual health. Um, and lastly, it's important to look at meaning when using feminist post-structuralism. So how people create meaning within their own experiences. And that was really something that was very evident in my research where, you know, there were perhaps certain definitions about, you know, for example, what, um, you know, postpartum sexual health should look like or what the postpartum body should look like. And participants, um, you know, oftentimes chose to create their own meaning of their bodies or their sexuality. And so that was something that was, you know, really, really powerful um, and how they cared for their sexual health. So I'll, uh, I'll uh, explain more of that in the results. And uh, lastly, my research question. So my primary research question uh, was how do postpartum individuals who have birthed a baby experience postpartum sexual health? Um, and sub questions included how do postpartum individuals negotiate relations of power related to their sexual health? And how is postpartum sexual health socially and institutionally constructed through different discourses? Uh, so the results uh, sort of were, you know, focused into three key issues. Um, so the first sort of focused on um, the body. So body image, um, meaning of the body as well as function of the body and how that, you know, perhaps shifted, stayed the same, but, you know, primarily how it was defined or redefined by postpartum individuals. Um, being within the postpartum body and negotiating discourse. And so this sort of focused on uh, physical aspects of sexual health um, and how certain discourses about, you know, sexual functioning and pelvic floor health, for example, um, were, um, were, you know, key um, in, in shaping how um, postpartum individuals in Nova Scotia experienced their sexual health. And lastly, feeling connected. Uh, so, you know, through desire, intimacy and support. So connection happened in, in you know, um, a variety of ways. Um, but was nonetheless important in, you know, um, helping participants to navigate some of these discourses that they, you know, deemed oppressive. Um, and also, you know, of course, caring for uh, the more emotional aspects of, of their postpartum sexual health. So looking at the key issue, um, and I'll go through each uh, one by one. Uh, so the first sort of sub theme within this first, um, first uh, key issue being uh, largely, you know, body image and meaning. Um, so the first was sort of centered on negotiating change. Um, so, you know, a new meaning of the body and identity. So, you know, I heard a lot of participants say, you know, this is something, you know, I feel uh, it feels like this is, you know, a new body or I'm having to sort of find my body again. Um, so there was certainly a discourse present here that um, desexualized postpartum bodies. And this was influential in how participants shaped their beliefs about their bodies and their sexuality as well as their sexual identity. Um, so meaning of the body was important. Um, again, there were kind of a lot of sort of things out there about, okay, what, what's, what's good and what's bad with, with, you know, the postpartum body? Um, how is it, you know, defined more generally? Um, and, you know, a lot of them kind of, you know, for example, um, ascribe certain meanings to certain body parts, such as their breasts um, or their vulva. Um, 
and sort of how it was a part of their sexual body or not. Um, so, you know, we of, often um, uh, sort of see a binary, you know, of, you know, breasts, for example, as being either sexual or for nurturing a baby. Um, but as I said, there's this binary that exists that says that they can't be both. Um, so we have to choose one or the other, which again was something that participants, you know, sometimes um, that was how they shaped, you know, their breasts. They said, you know, it's for feeding right now. Um, I, I don't feel like it's a part of my sexual body, but, you know, it might be once I'm, I'm done breastfeeding or once I choose to discontinue breastfeeding. Um, while others, you know, again, shifted that meaning and created their own meaning of their body and said, you know, my breasts can be both, um, you know, they're mine, but they're also for my baby. Um, and I'm, I, you know, they're, they were sort of balancing, balancing all the, all the roles that they, they carried. So that was kind of one example of how, you know, identity and the body was, was linked. Um, and it also very much tied in with sort of motherhood and mothering and identity around that. Um, so shaping mother as an identity or part of their identity in relation to the body. Uh, so a lot of participants challenged how dominant discourse positioned um, themselves as mothers um, or mothering as being in opposition to sexuality um, or sexual identity as a sexual sexual wo woman or sexual being. Um, because again, there's sort of these discourses that, you know, shape um, motherhood as being, um, your mothers as being, you know, pure and um, again, sort of desexualized, non-sexual. Um, so that was something that participants sort of had to negotiate of, okay, you know, um, perhaps they saw themselves of, as, you know, yeah, I am a mother and, you know, that means different things to me. I'm not necessarily just a mother. You know, I had a few who are said, you know, mother's just adding kind of to what I am otherwise, you know, I'm a, um, I'm a wife or a partner. Um, I'm a working woman. I'm, I'm an employee. Um, so some, you know, kind of really shaped, uh, shape themselves based on sort of motherhood and others said, you know, this is just kind of something else that, you know, I am, I am a mother, but I'm so many uh, other things as well, um, including a sexual being. And so, um, again, that kind of, you know, it, it took um, effort to challenge that, though. It's difficult um, to, to sometimes challenge these discourses that um, tell new mothers or postpartum individuals, you know, how they should be, how they should act, how they should look. Uh, all these things. So that was one, again, sort of centering on the body and meaning of their postpartum body. And so looking at the second sub theme, there was meaning, of course, as I said, in certain body parts, but other certain bodily changes um, for participants. So one, um, this is sort of a, a term toxic positive that was uh, sort of coined by by one of the participants in, in this study, um, speaking to, to a wider social discourse that heavily promoted the praise and embracing of certain postpartum physical changes, uh, such as stre stretch marks or, um, you know, swelling, uh, weight gain, those were kind of some of the examples that were used. Um, but for certain participants, they said, okay, you know, I'm, I'm told I, I need to embrace all these changes and love every part of my body. Um, and I love certain parts of my body, but it's also okay that I don't love certain, you know, other parts of my body. Uh, so, you know, one example was, you know, um, this participant had asked another mother for, you know, um, I guess tips or advice on um, any creams that she could use for stretch marks and was sort of told, you know, you should see those stretch marks as something positive. They represent that, you know, you, uh, you know, um, carried a pregnancy and birthed a baby. Um, and so that was sort of, again, we saw an example of how different, you know, people created different meanings about stretch marks, for example. Uh, so, you know, one saw that as being something that is really positive and it represents, again, that you carried a pregnancy and birthed a baby. And, you know, for others, you know, for the participant who told me about this example, it wasn't necessarily that she didn't believe that. Um, she said, you know, my stretch marks do represent that. But, you know, I would also like to care for my body in a certain way. And, um, you know, I would like a cream to help with the stretch marks. And that, that shouldn't be bad. You know, why am I being shamed for, for wanting a cream for that? Um, so that was sort of one example that that demonstrates that sort of toxic positivity that came out in a few participants experiences when they were, you know, talking about, again, certain bodily changes that they had experienced. So we know from that that there are certain hegemonic discourses um, pertaining to the postpartum body and body image um, that were upheld and perpetuated through others. Um, and participants, as I said, chose to either disagree with that um, or agree. Um, so again, we see that agency, we see that negotiation of relations of power in choosing, okay, this is what other people are saying, this is, you know, discourse, um, how am I going to create meaning here? Um, and that really shows that, that attention to, to responding to relations of power. Uh, so moving to key issue number two, because um, sort of largely focused on physical sexual health. Uh, so personal knowing and choosing to re-engage in sexual activity. Um, 
So this was something that was, you know, again, difficult to navigate is, you know, that feeling of readiness and what does, you know, feeling ready mean? Um, so two major dominant social discourses were at play here. Um, the first being that discourse um, that positions sex, sex, sexual activity as essential within relationships. And there was also a discourse that framed sexual health as a taboo topic, therefore rendering it invisible. Um, so a lot of participants in responding to those two discourses um, used intuitive knowing um, to sort of challenge discourse. And it sort of became this, this sort of um, frame of intuitive knowing versus discourse. Um, so intuitive knowing, you know, it provided a way for participants to articulate how they chose to listen to, you know, their own thoughts or feelings instead of those reflected by a dominant discourse that they perhaps, de you know, perhaps deemed oppressive. Um, so, for example, you know, the discourse that positions sex is as essential in relationships, you know, if they're saying, you know, I'm not I'm not ready to, you know, resume sexual activity in my relationship. Um, and that's OK. You know, um, others very much responded to that discourse by feeling pressured. Um, to, you know, um, resume sexual intercourse as, as quickly as possible um, after birth. And so, again, it was, it was you know, different. People had different ways of, of um, responding to that, that discourse. Uh, some participants knew they were not feeling ready to engage in sexual intercourse, though chose to engage in sexual activity for other reasons um, or to wait until they felt ready. Uh, so for some, you know, it was sort of, you know, I don't quite feel really ready. I don't know. But, you know, I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious to see how it's going to go. So, you know, um, even choosing to engage in sexual activity doesn't necessarily mean that they were ready or not ready. Um, but again, there were a multitude of reasons why perhaps they wanted to, you know, explore that facet of their sexual health after birth. Um, so um, the second sub theme here, uh, so caring for pelvic floor recovery. And this is sort of as I was touching on and, you know, reviewing what the literature, what we know, uh, pelvic floor health and pelvic floor recovery, something where, you know, there's been a bit more research done on this. And, you know, um, a lot of participants spoke of, you know, their pelvic floor health as well as, you know, recovery and seeking physiotherapy or, you know, whatever care it was uh, to help with the physical recovery in this in this instance. Um, so here, you know, to kind of frame things, there was a dominant social discourse that positioned pelvic floor pain or injury as embarrassing, taboo and shameful. Um, and there's also it's important to note here, I think there's another dominant medical discourse that, you know, postpartum, but more broadly uh, for women as well, um, normalizes pelvic floor issues and pain, um, especially, you know, given, you know, uh, there's sort of social taboo around these topics. Um, but we see that, you know, we see that same discourse emerging in, you know, issues such as endometriosis, um, menstruation, you know, all these sort of, um, I guess, physical experiences um, that, you know, um, people with uter uh, uterus, and, you know, experience um, throughout their life. It's, um, it's something that, again, is normalized. Pain is normalized more broadly in, you know, gynecology and women's health uh, at times. So it's important to kind of, you know, see how that discourse is coming together with the postpartum context. Um, so the fact that someone, you know, perhaps had, you know, uh, carried a pregnancy, um, birthed, and was now postpartum, of course, there are physical processes that accompany that, uh, that can result in pelvic floor injury. Um, and so this discourse, you know, I think was even more strongly evident um, in the postpartum context, simply because of childbirth. Uh, so pain or injury became even more normalized of, you know, okay, you just had a baby, what do you expect? that you know was very much present in in some um experiences but would not was not necessarily helpful for postpartum individuals who you know were trying to care for their their sexual health and their pelvic floor health as best as they could so there was a lot of kind of mismatch between reality and expectations regarding recovery um i spoke to several participants who had you know experienced a pelvic floor injury uh, to some degree and you know that was something that was really um they really cared about it was really important to them it could be also very stressful um, working through that and trying to, you know, navigate, um, uh, you know, sexual health around that. And one example of that is, um, you know, I, there was a participant who uh, said, you know, I was you know, going to physio very regularly, you know, I had quite a bad pelvic floor injury. Um, but, you know, part of my homework from my physio was to try engaging in, you know, sexual activity with my partner, um, you know, again, to sort of try and, and help with healing and, and recovery. Um, but, you know, having sex uh, be framed as homework, you know, that's a bit different, right? Um, so again, there was that sort of navigation that had to happen um, a little bit there and, you know, definitely impacted their sexual health. Um, and, you know, in, in talking about pelvic floor recovery, uh, one participant also mentioned, you know, this is very new. Um, you know, when we look kind of relatively, 
uh, relatively speaking, pelvic floor recovery discourses is very new. Um, and so, you know, that wasn't talked about perhaps, you know, when my grandmother um, gave birth or perhaps even when my mother gave birth, um, you know, that was just sort of emerging. So, um, but, you know, it's, um, it's it's something that we're seeing is that's emerging is, you know, this discourse of pelvic floor recovery even being, you know, a thing <laughs> uh, for lack of better words. Uh, so that was something that, you know, participants could use as a tool uh, to care for their sexual health and to access those resources, which uh, for those who did, they found it incredibly helpful. Uh, to have meaningful support, uh, largely again um, um, from pelvic floor physiotherapists, was uh, was the example that many of them used. And so, looking at subtheme uh, number three for the second key issue, um, so the impact of the six week check. So this was something that came up when a lot of um, I asked participants, you know, when was a moment that you thought about your sexual health? Um, it could have been, you know in the shower, in the grocery store, but tell me about a time when it, it, it kind of popped in your head. And almost everyone said, you know, when I was going for my six week checkup. Um, so this was a huge, uh, huge theme and huge moment um, for I think every single person that I, that I interviewed. So negotiating discourses was a big, big issue that came up here. And so for a lot of them, the, you know, the medical checkup with, which either occurred with an obstetrician gynecologist or usually their family physician or nurse practitioner um, in the primary care setting. Um, again, it's, it's part of, you know, routine care in Nova Scotia to have a six week postpartum check. And largely, you know, a lot of that check focuses on, you know, health of the baby as well as health of the mother. But um, expectations were kind of a bit different um, for, for postpartum individuals. Um, but, you know, in terms of sexual health, a lot of them interpreted the six-week checkup as, you know, a specific point when, um, okay, I feel like I should feel ready to, you know, re resume sexual intercourse. Um, some did feel ready. Some felt ready earlier. Um, but some did not. And so that resulted in intense feelings of, you know, again, feeling pressured, um, feeling they should be meeting certain, you know, this milestone. Um, you know, but some kind of felt like it was almost more of a deadline. And so it was kind of, okay, I'm not ready for this. This is, this is, you know, a little scary. Um, but it was, you know, a point when personal and social discourses were either supported or challenged by participants, um, as well as their healthcare providers. Uh, so again, we have the, this discourse coming in that, you know, sexual activity is essential, um, that it should always be happening no matter one's life stage, as well as the institutional medical discourse um, that positions healthcare providers as the gatekeepers or as the authority uh, when it comes to postpartum sexual health. So, you know, a lot of participants interpreted the checkup as being, oh, okay, um, permission. This is me receiving medical permission from my healthcare provider to resume se sexual activity. Um, but again, you know, what does that permission mean? What does it mean to them? How does it affect them? Um, why is there even a need for permission? Um, and why does that need to come from healthcare providers? So, you know, we see again, how that's framed in the medical setting specifically. Um, so the meaning of the appointment, you know, for some, a lot were feeling very stressed about it. I think at first it was largely, you know, I think a more negative experience for participants. Um, so then, you know, there was that meaning there as I touched on about, you know, the meaning of medical permission as well as assessment of the pelvic floor. So for, you know, perhaps the healthcare provider, they were assessing the pelvic floor, you know, perhaps for a variety of reasons to ensure, you know, physical recovery, um, if they had had, you know, an episiotomy to ensure sutures were healing and, um, uh, you know, all those things. But for, you know, a lot of the participants, they said, okay, they're, they're assessing if I'm, you know, gonna be ready to have, to have sexual intercourse or to engage in sexual activity again. Um, so again, there was kind of that mismatch where that communication was not necessarily happening between postpartum individuals what they needed from the appointment in terms of sexual health um, and what healthcare providers were seeing the purpose of the appointment as being. Um, and so, you know, if sexual health was ever talked about um, and, you know, it, it largely wasn't really, um, but if, if the conversation, you know, did include um, sexual health after birth, it largely focused on contraception um, and resuming contraception if that was something that the, part you know, the participant needed and or desired. Um, but, you know, again, all those emotional aspects, uh, relational, relational aspects that participants, you know, did want to talk about, um, it was, it was largely brushed over, uh, or ignored. So again, that discourse that really, um, renders these topics as being very taboo and, you know, then for, then it renders it invisible. Um, and that can be, you know, again, impactful. And lastly, moving to key issue number three. So feeling connected through desire, intimacy, and support. Uh, so sexual desire, that was something that, that a lot of participants felt had changed um, and most experienced a decrease in sexual desire, which again is not new. We know that that tends to happen um, after birth based on, you know, there's a lot of literature exploring that. 
And it can be due to hormones, tasks, responsibilities in caring for the baby, emotional, physical fatigue, physical symptoms or pain. Um, so again, this is this is something that you know we 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 know exists um, and that is common um, to that for that to happen um, during the postpartum period. Um, so the discourse that was relevant here was, you know, the dominant social discourse that frames sexual desire as essential and innate. So as I've said before, there was the discourse of sexual activity is, you know, um, essential, but also sexual desire as essential. Um, so therefore, you know, if there was any lack uh, or decrease in sexual desire, that was, you know, problematized uh, or, you know, discourse um, sort of frames it that way as being something that's a problem. Um, and that's also competed with the discourse that desexualizes the postpartum postpartum bodies and or people. Um, so with that, you know, participants were feeling, oh, you know, I should I, I feel like I sh should want to, um, you know, be sexually active, but I don't. Um, and so there's kind of this navigation of, again, you know, what's normal? A lot of participants, you know, um, wanted to feel normal in that way. Uh, you know, and I'm also experiencing this in my loan, um, you know, because I am, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm experiencing a decrease, but, um, you know, that was something that they didn't necessarily know was, you know, could happen. Uh, and again, sort of sought um, information and support from others to, um, to share that experience. Um, and overall, you know, participants, they didn't want to be told that they should want sex or be engaging in sexual activity. A lot of them framed, you know, this is something I should decide for myself. Um, there is that pressure, you know, sometimes, but also, you know, they didn't want to be told that they should be having certain feelings or be having sexual desire if, you know, they weren't at the time. Um, so again, this is kind of something that is, has been largely problematized. Um, we, you know, see terms like sexual dysfunction, um, you know, if sexual desire is an issue for the participant, then absolutely should be treated as such, but it shouldn't be assumed that it's, you know, bad to be having, you know, a decrease in sexual desire. Um, sexuality and sexual health fluctuates throughout the lifespan, including during the postpartum period. Um, and so that was something that participants, again, sort of used to negotiate and reframe um, sexual desire as, you know, um, something, you know, defining it in a way that was important and relevant to them, whatever that looks like. And so going from that, you know, as I said, generally, there was a decrease in sexual desire that participants experienced. So that also required them to redefine intimacy. Uh, so due to the general decrease and, and or lack of sexual desire, participants had to find new non-sexual ways of being intimate with their partner. Um, and, you know, participants wanted to feel connected and close to their, you know, partners um, because it was helpful in adjusting to all the new norms within their romantic relationship and, you know, per possibly being new parents together. Uh, so that was something, again, that was sort of change was, you know, what does intimacy look like um, for me, um, for, you know, my partner and I, and, um, you know, how do we make that a part of our relationship? Um, and, you know, that maybe needed to change in terms of how intimacy was, you know, shared uh, or experienced prior to pregnancy or even during pregnancy to now the postpartum and, you know, having that shift, um, especially if, you know, they were also, you know, juggling the responsibilities of, of new, be, new, being new parents. Uh, so participants challenged the discourse that requires sexual activity as part of intimacy within romantic relationships um, and, you know, instead chose to create their own meanings of intimacy. So, you know, several participants shared very different examples of what that looks like for them. Um, but some said, you know, even just cooking in the kitchen together, that's time that we have together um, to just, you know, be flirty, to goof around, to joke around. You know, that was something that the participants, you know, really found helpful in helping her feel close to her partner. Um, you know, even just kind of hugging or, you know, snuggling on the couch or just having, you know, a chat at the end of the day. Um, uh, so there were, you know, lots of different ways that participants kind of, you know, wove, wove in ways of, of sharing intimacy with, with, their, um, with their romantic partners. Um, so as I said, yeah, spending time together, flirting with their partner, uh, meaningful conversation. Uh, so those are all kind of, you know, ways to ensure emotional closeness and care for, for their postpartum sexual health and those more emotional facets of, of sexual health. And uh, so lastly, the meaning of support. Uh, support, you know, is a word, a big word. I think that's overused quite a bit. Um, um, but, you know, it's important to look at, okay, what does support mean? What does that actually look like when people say, I felt supported or I didn't feel supported? Uh, so looking at that for, you know, the participants in my study, support had very different meanings. But largely, um, you know, they, a lot of them spoke about how they felt supported um, by their romantic partners, as well as uh, within their social networks with um, other mothers, um, or even their own mothers, um, sisters, um, you know, family. Uh, there were kind of a few ways of, of, of seeking support in that way. Um, and of course, my, um, my supervisors have, have um, you know, done quite a bit of work in this area in terms of, you know, how 
mothers shape their social networks uh, within Nova Scotia. And, you know, we know that those social networks are very important in, in overall postpartum health and well-being. And so, you know, that was something that emerged in my study as being relevant to sexual health postpartum as well. Um, participants, as, as I said, had different meanings for support and caring for their postpartum sexual health. Um, and it was important in influencing how they negotiated relations of power in relation to their sexuality, sexual bodies, sexual activity, and sexual relationships. Um, so for a lot, you know, they, as I said, you know, a lot of the discourses I've touched on before of, um, you know, for example, feeling like sexual activity is essential, um, you know, the, you know, partners and social networks were really a key in helping to participants to, you know, frame their beliefs um, and to kind of, again, navigate that. It wasn't always, you know, easy of, oh, okay, I'm resisting this discourse. Like we don't, we don't need to be having sex. That's oppressive. No, um, it wasn't always necessarily that easy. And that's not necessarily what happened. Um, there was a lot of back and forth, you know, these, uh, it's, it's can be complicated. Uh, there's a lot of emotions that arise, um, you know, in navigating some of these discourses. So partners were, you know, a big support and that a lot of them touched on, you know, um, what that looked like, you know, for partners of what that was, you know, they give me space to just have time alone when I need, or they help with caring for the baby. And that really helps me, you know, be able to pay attention more to myself. Um, you know, maybe again, you know, um, increase, you know, how I can care for myself and my sexual health. Um, you know, not feeling pressured um, to engage in sexual activity, all those things that really allowed them to just explore uh, their experience first um, and to, again, you know, um, be able to honor their own values and beliefs, whatever those were with regards to sexual health. Um, so, you know, support from partners as well as from other postpartum individuals was important in shaping how participants, you know, responded to discourse. Um, and, you know, as I said before, that could be good or bad, you know, for talking to other postpartum individuals. Um, there were some that kind of said, okay, we have a disagreement here, you know, like the example I used with um, the stretch marks. Um, so that could go either way. But, you know, for those who spoke of, you know, again, feeling, you know, positive feelings about su feeling supported, um, that was really impactful and being able to say, you know, I can go talk to my sister. Like we talk about that all the time. Uh, she's having, you know, a few kids and she knows what it's like. She can really relate to my experience. Um, you know, that was just kind of one example that was shared. Um, you know, and, and again, help to promote sexual health. Um, so, uh, you know, again, looking at kind of how, how all of that's talked about, uh, you know, it's important to look at that, you know, in a healthcare context, and we saw that come out, um, but also, you know, what's going on at home, um, how, you know, how are participants navigating this, and who are the support people in that? Um, I think it's really important to pay attention to, so I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later as well, in terms of significance, and what we can maybe, um, you know, take from this in shaping future healthcare. Uh, so moving to significance. Um, so, you know, this is something that, again, I could discuss for two hours. Um, but, you know, it's we're seeing that, you know, sexual health, again, as I said, it's talked about in certain ways. Um, and I think it's important to sort of expand that and to, you know, create spaces where um, it can be talked about in meaningful ways. Um, and, you know, that meaning needs to be defined and decided by postpartum individuals themselves. Um, so in terms of, you know, those interactions, the postpartum checkup, but, but even during, you know, you know, prenatally and during pregnancy, um, those are conversations that perhaps, you know, we can begin to have, um, you know, with postpartum individuals um, and attending to, you know, questions they might have or just having information, you know, that can be really pow powerful too. I had, you know, a lot of uh, participants who said, you know, I didn't know that I could ask for an estrogen cream or that, you know, pelvic floor physio was even a thing. Um, and, you know, they said that was so helpful for me. And, you know, I had a few participants who, you know, had already had um, another baby and this was perhaps their second or third pregnancy um, or baby. And uh, so they knew they said, you know, it was so helpful this time because I knew what I could access. Um, so having that information, you know, up front right away, that's something that, you know, the health health care providers can do. Um, and, you know, so postpartum individuals, they need information and they need free available access to resources such as public physiotherapy. In this province, uh, physiotherapy is not publicly funded. Uh, so a lot of the you know, folks in my study talked about, you know, how it was so helpful. Um, but, you know, they paid out of pocket or had private insurance to, to be able to access this resource. Um, so, again, you know, they uh, were intentional in rec recognizing their privilege and being able to access those resources. Um, but again, that's something that we, we know is really important and can impact um, immediate postpartum health and as well as, you know, um, your gynec gynecological health in the long term. Um, so just knowing kind of what what's going on now in Nova Scotia and what perhaps, you know, could be done to, to make that more accessible. Um, health services and care must prioritize postpartum sexual health and maximize supports. 
Uh, so including supports within the postpartum individuals network. And I think that's something that isn't necessarily tapped into right now. Um, but, you know, we've seen from, you know, my study that uh, friends, family, um, you know, uh, partners uh, are all important supports for, um, you know, a lot of a lot of postpartum individuals. Um, and that's something that I think, you know, can also be um, be used, you know, I guess, to to our advantage um, as healthcare providers is, you know, having, you know, tapping into that sense of community. Um, it's something that I've seen, you know, is very strong in other settings that I've nursed in, uh, being, you know, Zambia or Tanzania, for example. Um, you know, that community and community support of health and individual health is, is, um, is there. It's something that is shared. Um, you know, if someone comes to an appointment, usually, you know, we, they have, you know, their parents or their aunts or children accompanying them as well. Um, and so again, you know, I, you know, I recognize this is a different context, um, but, you know, there was evidence in my study uh, to show that that could perhaps be, um, be better utilized um, in terms of, you know, healthcare, how healthcare is, is provided uh, in this province. More generally, there's also the need to normalize different experiences. And this, you know, as I said, it's, it's discourses are uh, difficult to name and even more difficult to, to um, you know, to untangle and to deconstruct. Um, so this is you know, something that happens more socially and institutionally and kind of on a wider scale. Um, but normalizing these conversations um, and normalizing this topic so that it can be better addressed and not, you know, uh, as brushed under the rug, um, because we know it's important to talk about and isn't talked about enough, or as I said, in, in meaningful ways. Uh, so those are uh, some of my references, and I'd like to thank you for your attention and welcome any questions or comments. Rachel, that was a really, really great presentation and uh, and such important uh, work in in women's health and relationship health. It, it, it was uh, really quite good and I quite enjoyed the discourse analysis. I've never done discourse analysis, so it was uh, it was nice to hear about it. Um, I am going to open it up for questions if folks want to use the the hand raise icon. Um, but I was going to start with a, a question, you know, the, this whole COVID thing, everything now we're going to frame everything we do in the context of, of COVID. Um, but I can't recall what our rules were around visitors and, and uh, how many people you were allowed to have in the house when you were collecting your, your data. Uh, but I know for, for pregnant women, just sort of in general, it was very difficult having babies during COVID and not having that social support and not being able to have your mom come over and, and, and help and, you know, extra sets of arms to hold and, um, so I, I do wonder uh, how that may have impacted uh, mental health, you know, of these women um, and, and, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe some depression, mild depression or whatever, and then that contributes to, um, to the relationship uh, issues they were, they were describing. Did you look at that at all? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a very interesting question. So thank you, uh, Dr. Hatchett. But um, yeah, so we actually, I, I'm on a team, I'm on, um, led by uh, Dr. Megan Aston and Dr. Sherry Price, my co-supervisors. Uh, we did look at um, uh, maternal mental health um, and, and uh, parental well-being during, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, and yeah, I found it was very difficult not having access to those social supports. Um, again, those people you might usually talk to or have around. Um, and so it was very isolating. A lot of them spoke about, you know, how um, anxiety was sort of compounded. Um, you know, there was so much uncertainty around, um, you know, even with COVID, is it even safe to breastfeed? Is the can that be transmitted? You know, at the time, there was so much unknown about, about COVID. And of course, you know, the isolation due to public health orders was, was very difficult for uh, for parents. So, um, you know, in relation to sexual health, we also know that depression is, you know, can um, increase the likelihood of sexual health issues um, by up over two times, uh, twice as much. So, um, you know, it's important. Um, so, you know, I had a few participants sort of mention COVID um, in terms of, uh, I think, kind of how, again, how does kind of intimate, what does that int intimacy look like? They kind of said, well, you know, I'm, I'm around the house all day, and I'm, you know, breastfeeding and just have sweats on and you know my hair is a mess kind of thing so that you know what they said that, that doesn't really make me feel confident or sexy 
Um, so they said sometimes, you know, it's helpful if my partner, you know, is, is, is complimenting me and saying that they still find me attractive, even though I really don't feel attractive. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some, sometimes that's something that can happen. Uh, whether we're in COVID or uh, or not, um, you know, you're, you're home, you're a new mom or a new parent, and there's lots going on. Um, so I didn't, uh, those, that's the only example um, that emerged in my data of someone specifically referencing COVID. Um, but of course, those social networks did look very different when I was doing my data collection. So a lot spoke of examples of connecting virtually uh, with, you know, support people um, and, uh, and having that as being sort of a way of not being necessarily their ideal way of connecting, um, but a way to sort of bridge the gap a little bit um, and connect with new, new mothers. Um, and it was interesting, a lot of my recruitment happened on um, Facebook, on certain mom groups. Uh, so it was HRM Babies 2020, or there are a few different groups, uh, but there's so much conversation happening on those platforms as well. Um, so, you know, the, the virtual village, so to speak, uh, something that we're wanting to look into more and that uh, my supervisors are, are now conducting conducting a study to see how that's experienced. Um, so yeah, excellent question, because there is definitely more we could know. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's that's what came up in terms of my study. If I can just hijack one more question. Um, I'm, I'm also curious, because I know you ha had some participants who um, it was their first parenting experience. Mm -hmm first postpartum experience and other people had multiple babies. Did any of the um, women who had two or more babies reference how they felt after other pregnancies? Like, I feel it's so different now than my first pregnancy or were there differences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a couple who, again, were, um, you know, had had multiple uh, pregnancies and, and children. So um, for them, I think it was a lot more of just sort of knowing what to expect. Um, I think they felt a little bit less uh, in the dark, so to speak, because they had had that experience. So they had that to draw back on. Um, but sometimes it, it wasn't necessarily the same also. So, uh, you know, as you're asking, it did sometimes differ a little bit in terms of, you know, well, things were, you know, a couple years ago, it was like this. And, um, and uh, you know, I think in terms of, again, attending a lot, a lot of them spoke if, you know, if they, it was their second or third pregnancy about sort of being proactive with seeking supports. I think that was the biggest difference in terms of, okay, I know what happens now. I did not know that happened postpartum. I did not know I was going to have, you know, uh, sore breasts and, you know, vaginal dryness and, uh, you know, whatever it was, right. Or to feel, you know, low and, and feel like this way about my body. Um, so a lot of them kind of knew ahead of time, okay, this is what I need to care for my mm -hmm. sexual health. Um, but yeah, also kind of identity, how that's framed was, was again, experienced a little bit differently uh, for some. So uh, yeah, some, there were some similarities that they could kind of fall back on and again, have used that intuitive knowing or that experiential knowing in a different way um, if they had had multiple pregnancies um, or yeah, or not. Some things also felt very new at the same time. So uh, yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you. Um I'll open it up to anybody else. I'm looking to see little hands up. Oh, Jeannie. Well, you knew you could count on me for a question uh, um, in this area. So thank you so much, Rachel. Terrific presentation. Very, very valuable work. And um, just so great to see this, the first voice approach um, that you're taking, ensuring that you know, we really hear from women's first voice perspectives on this important topic. So thank you. I also really like the point you just made around redefining intimacy, looking at the ways in which support networks might be part or might not be part of that, but maybe and including this virtual village idea that you've put forward. Very, very interesting. I'll look forward and watch for uh, new proposed work in that area. But my question is around um, really, I, I, and I recognize this was a, a qualitative discourse analysis that, you know, we can't do everything in every single study. But I was I was just curious to, and maybe you didn't have time to present it today, um, if you could speak to what, if any, issues um, arose during the interviews or during the study itself that you think might also help us think differently about the ways in which we approach trauma-informed care uh, more broadly, as well as within the postpartum period. 
So I'm wondering if any of that came up or if you've given any thought to that notion of trauma informed care as an important kind of piece of doing excellent care. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I know. Thank you so much. That's yeah, an excellent question. Um, and, you know, that was something that um, I do definitely think that there was data to sort of um, or participants did speak about some aspects of that. Um, it it uh, was not, I guess, sort of a, um, a primary issue. And so it was it was not pre presented today. Um, but it, your question makes me think back to a participant who um, I believe um, uh, was uh, uh, situated more rurally, um, but talked about the birth experience and how that um, shifted their um, definition or meaning of touch and physical touch. Um, they spoke about how they believed that the, you know, the, the birthing experience that they had was, you know, um, positive, but also made them feel very vulnerable. They said, you know, there, you have medical providers coming in and touching you everywhere. Um, and very, very, um, would generally be considered intimate places if they're doing, you know, pelvic exams or, um, you know, PV exams as we call them. Um, and so with that, uh, you know, I remember the participant said, you know, that did, that kind of changed how I see touch because I have this baby, um, you know, breastfeeding now and can kind of feel touched out that way. And then I just, you know, had, I, you know, gave birth and, and um, had that experience of being, you know, um, touched in order, in order to be cared for. And it was consensual touch um, in the healthcare setting, but also kind of, again, shifted that meaning there. Uh, so in terms of your question of, you know, how, you know, how can we better provide trauma-informed care? It's certainly important and certainly something that we, you know, would like to uh, further implement, um, as you're saying. Um, but yeah, that can really, I think, shape their experiences. And of course, we don't know uh, what people's experiences are prior to that, um, uh, you know, as well. Um, but, you know, that birthing space, that postpartum space, you know, participants can sometimes, or they did sometimes feel very vulnerable. Um, and so again, you know, just being supported and, and having their questions um, answered and, you know, having that attention given uh, to what their concerns are. You know, I think a lot of them felt so brushed off of, um, you know, I remember one who, um, you know, after six months was still having a lot of pain with sexual intercourse and went to her healthcare provider and uh, was told to use Crisco uh, and come back in six months. Um, <laughs> So again, it's that attention, it's that honor and that space that we give give um, people, postpartum people in, in discussing these issues, um, rather than having it be brushed off, because I think that's a huge piece of what can, you know, uh, contribute to or, or, or impact, you know, past or present experiences of, um, of, of trauma and trauma informed care. Thank you, Rachel. Um, anybody else? I don't see any more hands. Last call for questions. Okay, Rachel, I can't thank you enough. I this whole area of research um, that that you're doing, and uh, Megan and Sherry and Natalie Rosen, it's just it's such important work and it's so wonderful to see uh, such a focus on these important areas of, of women's health at the IWK. Um, thank you so much for your time and thank you for luck, having me. <laughs> good luck with the, the rest of your uh, research. Maybe uh, we you. can get you again uh, next year for whatever study two is going to be. Yes, yes, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, this was this was amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Take care.